Welcome to I Love It Here, a place where we discuss and share our thoughts on various topics, all focused on making life and work a better experience for everyone. Welcome to I Love It Here, a place where we try and support people with lots of little pieces of information through our amazing conversations. Your host today, as usual, are myself, Caleb Foster, Paul Westlake and Jonathan Cooper. So let's in get into a great chat today. Well, thanks for the intro, as usual, Caleb. I hope you're well. Good to see you, Jonathan. I Likewise. thought we'd have a bit of a change this month and... Um, I know Caleb's been a little bit busy, but more of that a little bit later on. So I thought we'd dive straight in with uh, a bit of an update on what we've been up to, and more importantly, what we may be thankful for, and um, let's start with some gratitude. So um, over to you, John, then. Oh, thanks. Thanks, Westy. Well, I'm really excited because this month I have uh, I've made a major purchase. Yeah, I went out about uh, three weeks ago, and I bought myself a Brompton an electric Brompton, ah. which, oh, which, wow. which is which has proved to be. I hired one for for, for a weekend to, to to try it out, and uh, it has transformed my life. I haven't been, uh, I haven't. Well, there are a couple of cases where I've been in the car, but basically I've been travelling either on public transport or paddling my new uh, my new bike around, and it's uh, it's fantastic. I really really love it. It's uh, how, it's so how... cool. How how much weight does the battery bit add to it then? Because they're quite they're, they're, they're designed to be quite small, right? So I'm assuming they're the battery small. adds a load so of weight. So the whole thing the whole thing weighs the whole thing weighs 17 kilos, which if you're not pedalling with the battery is kind of up a hill in Sheffield is kind of hard work. But <laughs> with the battery on and the motor running at the kind of like the, the the middle power band, I've been whizzing around for the most part whizzing around Birmingham. So getting from Sheffield to uh, to to New Street and then. Uh, most of my journeys in Birmingham were without um, the aid of public transport. And have you, and have you got one of those big, big orange boxes on your back? I'm assuming you're moonlighting, are you? <laughs> I have got, a, <laughs> I have got a fairly fluorescent rock. Delivering pizzas or something, but Jonathan? I'm not, I'm not delivering pizzas. No. <laughs> <laughs> it's really well, fast. It's a fantastic. Piece. It's a fantastic piece of kit. I really, really love it. It's just made life. You know that thing when you get a bike when you're a kid. And you ride around, kind of like holding up the hands, standing on the pedals, and just whizzing around and feeling like this great sense of freedom. What? Well, yeah. I've man I've, it's like that. It's brilliant. So in between meetings, I'm getting this 20 minutes of of pure youthful joy. It's, it's fantastic. <laughs> it's really, really great. Oh, nice. I'm highly recommended. Always fantastic. I, I didn't even know they made. Sorry, go ahead, Caleb. I, I was saying. I spoke to Jonathan. Um, earlier in the month when we met up and it he was ta telling me about the Brompton that he was using he was he, he was considering buying it and I said I always think of um Dave Shaw at Kineo yes it, I think he used to have a Brompton as well he did use to have a Brompton but you know what Dave Shaw at Kineo I, I I it was not not long after I first started at Kineo and I walked down and I said heard just someone behind me going morning and he sort of came past me and that was Dave Shaw on his skateboard on his oh. way to work. <laughs> so he literally from the station in his longboard come down, zooming. Or, I, honestly, the stories I could tell you about that. I think <laughs> I, I spoke to um, you. You know the uh, you know Paul Welch as well, Caleb from yeah. from uh, from Kineo. and he, he used to have a saying um, when I worked there, which was, um, "I thought." That's the most Brighton thing I've ever seen. And that was his <laughs> saying. And I said, what do you mean? He said, and he came in one morning and he said, I saw the most Brighton thing I've ever seen. And bear in mind, I've lived here for a number of years. <laughs> he said, Someone came past me on a penny farthing and he yeah. raised his hand and went, morning. <laughs> and, just kept going. and he's like, what? And he went, and the thing is, no one bats an eyelid. Because you know what? As he said, it's the most Brighton thing ever. That's just exactly what it is. But yeah, Dave Shaw used to... Used to skate or brompton you're right there was always a fold-up bike near his yeah. desk you're absolutely right yeah I'm, I'm just thinking also about um jonathan getting an electric <laughs> version of that you can't I've, i keep seeing it on instagram that there's a company and i think i want to say strike or something that you can retrofit a battery switch any, i'll switch that's it and I've now got an image of a penny farthing with a switch on. <laughs> It'll happen. 
<laughs> no one no one about an island. <laughs> it was the way that a guy there. came past and doffed his cap and did the yeah. morning. You are so bright and <laughs> <laughs> love that. Love that. So no plans to move further down south then, uh, Jonathan, just to be with the bright <laughs> Not not, not this in. week, no. No. <laughs> My, but, but but perhaps but who knows? As I as I become more bright and where I might end up. Well, maybe there's no way you. you're commuting from where you are to Brighton on an electric bike. It'd be dead within about ten mile, wouldn't it? Yeah, but there's always the train, and then you can kind of commute when you get. That's <laughs> oh, the way yeah, to do it. Well, de- delivery do stretch a long way. <laughs> they do. <laughs> I'm not sure I could make a living that way, do you? <laughs> oh, very train good. Fair, you know, I, train I, I, I haven't one seen pizza delivered. I hadn't seen the outline for the script of the show, but I'm, I can almost guarantee this wasn't going to be on it, right? Where's, where's that gone already? Well, we always say it's a bit organic, this show. God, not much. <laughs> so, so Wester, what are you grateful for? Oh, thanks. Follow that. Yeah, I've got no chance. Do you know what? Um, Have c- you got a couple a bits and pieces in the last week? <laughs> no, no, I haven't. No. Um, I, I was thinking about this before we came on earlier. I thought, what am I really grateful for? There, there's a few bits. So, um, firstly, and I, I'll share this because I'll say in the green room when we, we were just chatting before we came on. My wife told me at the weekend that she thought we needed a bit of a break. We've had, we've had a bit of a rough time at the moment, and uh, she's booked um, a, a, a couple of little holidays. Holiday. Let's yeah, a couple of holidays properly. didn't know anything about, which was really not in Brighton. No, we're going to um, we're going we're going surfing in Cornwall, which will be a, a real opener for me. So that that'll be interesting. So can I? I know we say you always roll your eyes when I say, "Can I do two? I want to do three. Oh, come on. I know. So no, the first one was that one. That I know. Your eyes. Nobody else does. <laughs> so the first one was that. The second one, um, my youngest daughter's finished her uh, GCSEs now, which is great. So she's sort of off for the for the holidays. Um, so I'm really proud. I bet she of effort said she a lot put more in. than it feels great. Oh uh, well, <laughs> yeah. But did she, um, she's been working for me, and you know what? As in, she's been doing some e-learning design so as you know i've put some templates together do some really stuff and i i really what i'm really grateful for is i know we all roll our eyes at you know the, oh, the, the youth they don't care and they've got no attention to, her attention to detail is brilliant and i really like that i really love the fact that she says yeah i looked at that dad it didn't look quite right so i've reworded it is that okay or i've done this and i think this would look better i i love that i love the fact that she's got the um the now to sort of second guess it and and come back and and also to do it and then come back and check so rather than coming to me every 30 seconds and say what about she's like i just thought it would look better like this i can change it back if you like and i'm like no no, no that's fine so i'm really really pleased pleased with that um so that was only two wasn't it did i said i have three didn't i Let's uh, move on quick. can't remember what the third one was but so i'm anyway i'm grateful for basically the amount of effort she's made and for the holidays i've got coming up so hey. there you go now you've been, you've been busy as well caleb haven't you well, I, I have actually, but there's something that links back to what you've just said about your daughter as well. So I um, I attended a workshop in London uh, last month, I think it was, with Strategic Coach. And sometimes, um, oh, what's, the, what's the word when you just um, meet someone? Serendipity. Oh, blimey. So yep. I'm... Like it just happens sometimes, doesn't it? When you just meet someone, you get chatting, and you you know that you've got um, you know like minded interests. So I met a, a guy called Dominic Monkhouse, and we got talking. He said, "Oh, I, it just in conversation." He does a podcast called The Melting Pot, um, and he was talking about some books and stuff. And I said, "Well, I I do a podcast as well, you know, with a couple of colleagues." Well, we tried and tried to get our calendars coordinated and, and we couldn't actually. So I had a conversation with um, Dom, uh, mainly about culture and what makes a, a great culture, actually. But it was a really great conversation. Um, and the 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 link, actually, what you're saying, um, what your daughter was picking up on doing stuff is I, I really asked him about how do businesses get culture right in organization and he yeah. said i actually think it's quite simple he said that everyone should be driving for excellence and not just setting for mediocre because mediocre is so easy 
he said, but what steps a culture at? Because everyone wants to play with A-grade people, right? Yep. First team players, whatever it is. And so that's how we got into a conversation. But anyway, rather than me rabble on, why don't we have a listen and do you see what you think? I work as a business coach for entrepreneurial CEOs who I guess I would say they're purpose-led. So then they're growing businesses because they have something larger than making money as the at the core of their business. So we've got clients who are trying to change the lives of Filipinos, trying to change the lives of people in South America, minding the gap at, inside the NHS. Just And I get a sense of living my life vicariously through their success, if you like. So if I can help them to be more successful, I can have an impact on the world in a little way. And I, I think you you are involved in that, aren't you, by definition, really, because you, you help, I suppose, I'm assuming you put a bit of a framework around some of what they do or enable them to do what they want to do or get the best out of it. Yeah, helping people get clarity is probably the first bit. Uh, where people sort of say, what's our view of vision for the future? Because unless people are rowing in the same direction, then they're not. And so I, I suppose what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to help them be more efficient, you know, because they're trying to do something for a bigger purpose. And and they might not have a plan. They might not have the right people. They might not have not how, not know how to pull it together. Yeah. Um, so just looking for where their squeaky wheel is and teaching them to fix the wheel. Yeah, I like it. I like the, uh, like the phrase. I, and those things like that, that, you know, that I pick up on, you, you must use them all the time, the fixing the squeaky wheel, you know. Well, it's, it's, it's it, like, because I have a set of, I have a toolbox full of tools. Yeah. Right. And you could get out and go, hey, look, I've got a spanner. It's like, well, that's not really very helpful unless actually it's solving a bigger problem. So each client has a different set of problems because they're a different set of people on a different journey. And so the tools, you'll take a client through a, a set of tools to get a sort of baseline. And then it's, what do we think? Where, where we, if we put the time and effort into something, where will we get the biggest return? Yeah. And it's just, and then reviewing that every quarter, quarter over quarter, quarter over quarter. So I suppose one of the other things is changing their timeline and getting people to, I, I think about it in terms of playing a game. So, you know, even even my girls are nine and seven and are very competitive. So if they're playing a game, somebody has to win and somebody has to lose. Yeah. But it's like that. I remember when we played football in the park as kids, you know, put down a couple of jumpers and, and you know how long you've got to play. You know what the rules are, you know, and and often companies are playing a game, but it, there's no rules. There's no, you know, you don't know when somebody's offside or when the ball's out of play or, or, or we don't or know they... what the score is. Or they overly complicate it as well. Oh, totally. Totally. So, or people are just, oh, I don't know, like social media, right? You can pick your phone up and lose an hour. And businesses do the sort of the equivalent of that. Yeah, you know, yeah. there's a thing here that we need to focus on. Like, why do we need to focus on that? Why are we doing that? I mean, you know, I was with a client last week that still do annual appraisals. And, uh, and, and I said, um, can anyone provide me some evidence that suggests that this is actually not just a complete and utter waste of time? Now, yeah. some companies do it because the HR team say, well, managers don't record anything. And if you want us to fire people, we've got to have some evidence trail. But that's not the same as the rationale, the rationale for doing it in the first place, which was uh, employee engagement, development and performance management. And it's just an annual appraisal. But, to but suck I, all I suppose if you... And I guess that's where businesses are on their maturity scale, right? So if you're if you've got nothing, then an annual appraisal is better than nothing. No, nothing do you think is better? It's just it just it's don't better do to it. do nothing. Well, because the thing is, what you've done is you've said big companies have annual appraisals, and so therefore an annual appraisal must be better than nothing. All oh, right, but there's no evidence <laughs> to say it's better than nothing. What you're doing is you're just going, I'm just going to do what somebody else does yes, without I thinking about what I'm trying to achieve, but. You see, if you shorten the time frame down to 90 days, you don't really need an annual appraisal. No. What you're going to do is you're going to do daily, weekly, monthly, quarterly, 
And then at any point, you can add up the last four quarter scores and you've got an annual score. I always think that that's a, that's a byproduct, though, is it? That's a, that's a process that's been implemented. Like, if you, if you went back to the, to the start and said, what, what do we want to be famous for? What, what's, you know, how do we want people to, to be and feel and act in our organisation? You would let you would do that in so many different ways. Your go to wouldn't go. Oh, we better do an annual appraisal. We better do a staff survey. Or you know, yeah, it's just well. And I and I think I think actually what you've hit on is uh, one of the ways in which we set strategy, which is if you look at our business from the angle of different stakeholders, how might we become world famous? Um, and I was reading. Uh, there's a Hollywood hotel. I can't remember the name of it off the top of my head. Uh, magic it's called the magic castle i can remember and they have a, an emergency popsicle phone by the pool and so if you ring the popsicle hotline somebody will pick <laughs> it up and say um what flavor ice lolly would you like and, uh, we'll love that. and we'll be straight down right now so it's not the biggest hotel it's not the smartest hotel it's not the most up-to-date hotel but there's two or three things that they've decided they'll be world famous for yeah and one of them is to put in this popsicle hotline by the yeah. pool which people then talk about all the time in social media and they're full all the time. Yeah. And, and, and I suspect people are paying a premium for the hotel. So, or they so they can stay at it just so they can experience the, the popsicle phone. Totally. Yeah. I, I, I was talking to a colleague the other day actually, and, and they've got a, she was reflecting on a um, CEO and saying he's such a cool guy, but he's, he's nailed how we're driving things forward. And it's as simple as, does this make us famous or does this make us rich? If it's a combination of the two, then it's a definite. If it's one of them, then it's obviously considered and probably move forward. If it's neither of them, why are we bothering? Totally. But I mean, from a stakeholder perspective, you can say, look, we've got some investors, so they need a return on their investment. Uh, we've got employees. Uh, we've got... Um, you know, we've got customers, clients, we've got suppliers. And for each of them, there is a different lens on the strategy. And so often, you know, as you, as you say, you know, you might say, um, <laughs> if you go, all oh, right, we, people, people, are, what's, what's one of your differentiators? People. And then I often say to the executive team, okay, so if people is a differentiator, right? If this is part of you being unique, there will be people processes in your organization which are unique to you. What are they? And there's just this silence, silence yeah. because they haven't looked at it from that perspective. What they've done is they've put in an annual appraisal scheme and they've done a staff survey. And it's yeah. like, well, everybody does that. How is that is different? <laughs> You're going to have to do something. I, and I, it, it's, I've worked for organizations in the past that, that will say people are the heart of our business. And exactly that, when you call it out and say, well, what, so what are you doing to make those people energized, to love what they're doing, to turn up on a Monday morning? I was thinking Monday morning, nine o'clock, we're doing a podcast. And if I was employed in an organization, what would I be feeling at this time? And a lot of people, and I don't know what the percentage is, but you'd say, 75% of people wouldn't be going, do you know what? I can't wait for nine o'clock to start because I just wanted to get into a great conversation. Most of them would be going, oh God, I wish I could relive the weekend again. <laughs> so what, what, what are these organizations doing to sort of turn that and make people go, I can't wait to get in well, at 8.30 on Monday morning? So I, I think, I think averages and averages are um, most companies are average and most people will work in an average business and the owners of those businesses or the leaders of those businesses are doing absolutely jack shit mm. to make that a better place to work if they are they're just wasting their time because they're not being systematic but uh if i look at there's some research came out from mckinsey looking at drug development in pharma companies 85% of the teams thought they were above average. Wow. So group delusion. 
uh, one per- the top 1% were 10 times more productive than the average, which when you generate a drug, that be- uh, a prescription drug, you get eight years of patent at the end. And the top 1% were bringing the drug to market 500 days quicker. So it's an extra day, it's an extra year and a half of, of, of you know, and these drugs cost billions of dollars to bring yeah, to yeah. market. So yeah. it's, it's huge. Yeah. The next two, three, four, five percent at the top were sort of 5x uh, the average. And so I think, I think the clients I like to work with, the clients I do work with, are those people who want to be in that top 1% yeah. and, and are definitely going to be in that top five. And I think you then, those clients, I mean, I just think about my time when I was uh, at Rackspace. We did, we did one year, we did 26 benchmarking visits. So we looked at the Sunday Times best place to work and we said, we want to be in that list. We want to be the best tech company to work for in the UK because what's the point in being the second best tech? I mean, nobody remembers who got silver in the Olympics. No. Um, and so we did 20, we sent people out to 26 companies that scored better than us in the Sunday Times best place to work to find out yeah, what, what they doing? were doing that yeah. we could nick. Yeah. And, uh, you know, we, it was just, you've got to be... You got to have a systematic process for wanting yeah. to get better. If you want to get fit, you get a coach, you follow a program. You do do the same if you're a business. I, I, I'm intrigued. You know that that stuff that you're referencing about rack space. So those, the top three. So I get it from a competitive point of view. The top three will always be competitive. If you're then below that, what I see is a lot of businesses will go. Well, we we get mixed up in this group, and it's easy to hide. In the top three, you're not hiding, and that's what drives you, you know, constantly to go. I'm third at the minute. I need to be first. I'm second at the minute. I need to be first. You know, and if you drop down, I want to be first. But the or, others, or you, it's easy to might, hide. Or you might even slice the market slightly differently, and you might say, the world is looking at us, and we're number three from a revenue perspective. Okay, but are there segments of the market when we're number one? Yeah. Right. Are we number one in the 18 to 25 year age group? Are we number one in the north of England? Are we number one in Germany, but number three in the UK? Yeah. And you're looking for opportunities uh, to to be to be number one. You are. You are. If you're playing to win, if yeah. you're <laughs> uh, yeah. and that's yes. the difference, isn't it? And you, you know, so those people that are playing to win will slice that in any way to go, I'm first. But the important thing is not to just find a segment that you're first and go, I can lean back because I'm first. <laughs> it's to constantly drive that to go, yeah. you know, not only. So that's a start. And I suppose that's a motivator for the team below you that don't always, you know, get inspired by that. It's something to hook on to to sell to the rest of the team. And then you go. Right, we're now fifth in the other markets. We need to be first, and you're constantly challenging. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's like I often think about when people say something, I think, what is the opposite of what they're saying? And is that possible? Because, you know, when somebody says uh, something about their core values, I don't know, uh, we have integrity. I'm like, how could you not have integrity? How could you be the, how could you be the unintegrity company? Like we're a bunch of lying, cheating, thieving bastards, uh, right? I mean, like, w- could you go to market like that? It's like, no, well, in that case, integrity is pointless because people just assume it's true. Assume it, yeah. And when you say play to win, I go like, is, could you play to lose? Is there, a, is there a play to lose thing? It's like, I don't get it. Like who would play to lose? No, but there, there are a lot of organizations that, that sit there protecting what they've got rather than risking. Ah, playing not to lose, yeah. I see, as opposed to playing yeah. to win. Yeah, yeah. yeah. In def- well, it's that scarcity versus, uh, oh, I've gone brain dead. Um, abundance. abundance. Scar- yeah. Scarcity versus abundance. I got. I, I, I was away at the weekend for my uh, wedding anniversary. and, and the, we oh, got congratulations. Del- we got, uh, thank you. Um, thunderstorms and Heathrow, so we got to sit in Greece for an extra two hours. Oh, didn't, get, no. <laughs> didn't get home till after midnight. So <laughs> there's always a silver lining. <laughs> I, do, do you know what I'm also thinking? Those when when you went out and asked these other businesses about what the small things that they're doing to make them the top tier players, are most of these organisations happy to share that information? Oh, completely. Yeah. I mean that one of the. Um, one of the things 
uh, that we found is that we ended up on a we ended up part of an, an organization called Best of British. And so for a few years, we would have busloads of CEOs come to our office in at Ragspace uh, to see how we see what we were doing because uh, we were seen as innovative and the staff thought it was amazing right because you know I would stand there and say we were a great place to work but when 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 total strangers turn up and they say we're here because we believe you are an amazing company to work at people are like oh oh you know like it has a totally yeah you know, nothing else has changed, but their perception shifts when a busload of strangers turn up to talk to them, sort of wander around and talk to them. Uh, it's fab. Well, and I mean, I think that's right of the people that are always playing in that space and aspiring to be better, because actually one of one of the things that stands you out is to learn from others and to, you know, to steal with pride and to, you know, not not replicate that identically, but you take the best bits, re-engineer it that fits in your culture, your organization, and then that just keeps incrementing what it means to be a great place to work or do amazing stuff or whatever that measurement is that says we're number one. Well, and I, I think when, from, my, from a CEO's perspective, when the culture, assuming it's still going in the right direction, uh, starts to develop on its own. It's fabulous because until then you're having to lean in all the time and spin the flywheel and it's effort and effort and effort. Yeah. And we, I'd started a thing called um, dress up smart day. So, uh, because most of the time, <laughs> most, because most of the time, we of course wore... you did. It's like, well, I fed up with dress down day. Let's... Well, because I, I just, I, I remember going to see a guy at Panasonic and it was dress up. It was dress down day on a Friday at Panasonic. And this yeah. poor bloke, he had he had a shirt and tie on, and he had his <laughs> and he had his brogues on. The only thing he'd swapped out is suit pants for a pair of jeans, and he looked right. the most uncomfortable man in the world. And I came back sort of, and I was there in my, I was there in jeans and jeans and a t shirt. But most of the time, people would wear flip flops or bare feet, shorts and a t shirt, right? And so I said, look, well, people came for an interview. They had a suit, so we know they've got one. So let's just do this. Let's just on a, one, the last Friday of the month, let's everybody wear a suit to work just to poke fun at the rest of the world that thinks you have to dress up smart to go to the office. Right. And uh, so we did that. And the first time I did that, I'm in the lift and I'm thinking it'll only be me. They've all nodded and said, yeah, good idea, boss. Uh, and it's just me. So anyway, I walked out and everybody was in a suit. Um, and then later on, they changed and it was like, wear your pyjamas to work. And I'm like, yeah. I'm, not my, I'm not, it's like... But, you know, it, it, was, it was okay. Pressure. It was okay. I, I, I'd, you know, go for your life, people. I have to say, it's just mainly because I have this aversion to fancy dress. Yeah. Well, <laughs> uh, that was going to be my next thing. Someone's dressing up as a clown and go. <laughs> so, you know what? I Things like that where I just go, uh, you've got to try and make it inclusive. The suit thing was quite inclusive. Everybody, everybody could do smart. But wear your pajamas. Some people don't want to do that. Dress up in it. Dress up as a clown. I'm, I'm out at that point. I'm done. So, but then uh, I suppose that's an interesting take as well. So, <clears throat> when I always have this idea that when someone says, "Well, what is culture?" or when you're trying to explain culture, I, I say it's almost like this sort of grey mist that you're trying to catch, and you never really can define it. It's well. It's this one day and it's that another day. It's uh, just a sort of a living thing. I see. I think it's easy. Go on then. So I, I, I think it's a thing, but it's it's a bit like happiness, right? It's over there and you've got to approach it tangentially, right? And it's not bean bags and pool tables. But if um, if I go into a hotel, so I was staying in, I was staying in a in a hotel in uh, in Italy earlier this year. And uh, you get in the shower, you get the shower stuff, and you take the top off, and there's this tiny little silver cap. And the only way to get the silver cap off is with your teeth. And you end up with shampoo in your mouth. And I came down to breakfast, and I said to the guys I was there with, I said to them, have you had shampoo for breakfast already then? And they're like, oh, yeah, it's ridiculous, isn't it? Like, that is a hotel that doesn't have an excellent culture. Because I bet you all of those employees have nicked one of those shampoos and taken it home. And ended and up with shampoo it. in their mouths. Yeah. And yet the hotel still buys this ridiculous 
Or I remember I took over a company called Pipex years ago, and I I oh, went I into the Pipex, <laughs> and I went I went into the call center, and at the bottom of the stairs were three telephone books just covered in dust. It's a while ago when telephone books were still a thing. Anyway, I called the the director. Said, "Look, shall I show you around?" I said, "No, let me show you around." I said, "You have come into this building for months, and you've seen three phone books at the bottom of the stairs covered in dust." And you haven't picked them up, and nobody's anybody knows anybody, nor has anybody yeah. else. This is this is this is not an excellent culture. This is just this is just like do as little as possible. And he was offended, but I was right. We fired him, <laughs> and uh, it, it was just it, because it just there was no excellence, there was no pride. And what right? uh, if and I so go into if I go I'll go into a company and I'll go into a conference room. And I'll pick up a board marker and I'll go and write on the board. The pen doesn't work. Put it down, I'll pick up another one. The pen doesn't work. There's three or four board markers in the in the conference room. None of them work. Why am I the only one who puts them in the bin? Yeah. Like, why did the last person in this company who used this board marker not throw them in the bin and buy some more board markers? Because they don't care. They just don't care. And, that... and so I think culture is where people go, I care. Yeah, And I'm constantly looking for opportunities that aren't in my job description. It should be a, I think if somebody says it's not in my job description, the trap door should just open up and they should disappear and we should never see them again. Just. But, so do you think that's, that's already in people? That, so like that specific example of people not seeing, not caring, do you think there's an opportunity to get them to a point of, caring yes some of them will care but they're just not so um i put in my new book uh, a story that moira clark who's head of customer experience at henley management college told me years ago there's a bank in the north of england in a city in the north of england and they had so you know uh economic economic situation of their customers and the weather is the same you know for the whole for these two branches they took the best performing branch manager and they put him in the worst branch and nothing happened he had to take a third of his people with him to get a sort of critical mass because there are there are the sort of the believers the non-believers yeah. and the yeah. fence sitters yeah. and and the non-believers or the miserable ones or just the people for whom it's a job and it'll never be anything else they they'll they leave of their own accord if they see themselves outnumbered and and that uh, expectations are rising. Yeah, and a bit like children and dogs, right? You can't beat people to do this. You have to you have to give social currency. So the leaders have to give praise when they see the behaviours that they want. You know, you can't beat your children for not tidying up their bedroom and expect them to do it. You know, you have to say it's amazing that you've tidied up your bedroom. Yeah. Minty, that's great. You've put all the toys away. Well done. And then she'll like, she'll do it again. Or the dogs, yeah. you know, yeah. sit, stay, you know, have a biscuit. Right. It's and great just... to observe other people doing that. And then you could just sit back and go, that's probably not the best way to get the best out of your kids and your animals. <laughs> so, but you can't see that in the moment. You sometimes need someone else to go, just step back and observe this. Yes. So, uh, I mean, I've hired, I hired a, I hired a guy years ago to be a software developer for us. And at the end of the interview, I said, any other questions? And he said, yeah, just one. Will anybody shout at me? I said, what do you mean? I said, why do you like to be shouted at? Is it something that we have to make sure that we do? He said, no, he said, I just get shouted at every day where I work at the minute. It'd be lovely to go somewhere and not get wow. shouted at. That was his measure of success. <laughs> yeah, I said, well, I promise you, we'll never shout at you. But, but, we, but we do e e expect excellence. <laughs> you no, know, that's it. I think... I think that's fair. If you say to people, look, we're expecting you to work hard. I, you think, the thing is, if you, if you go and hire A players, top 10% of available talent for a given yeah. job in a given location at a given salary, those people want to work with other people like them. You know, right. they, yeah. they want to work with people with high expectations who spot shit that needs fixing and yeah. fix it. Yeah. And, and work hard, work fast. Yeah. I think we had this conversation before. I mean, it is so true. It is a, like, I was involved in the um, Leicester Tigers um, Junior Academy. And if you said to any of those 
um, lads, <coughs> kids, what, what's your, you know, what's the vision? What's the goal? Do you think any of them would have said, oh, I want to play, you know, sixth tier rugby? I want to, <laughs> you know, that course, all of them are saying, I want to play for Leicester Tigers. I want to be in a premiership. But they were actually beyond that at that point in their life. They were... They would have gone, I want to play for England. They would have skipped a whole load of work in between. And that's because all the other lads were pushing them to go, we want to be the best in here. And I suppose the biggest challenge at the minute is, well, how how do we get those top 10% in our organisation? Because, you know, there's there's a lot of competition that if you truly do want there to employ no comp- those there's top no, ten, there's no competition. There's no competition because almost everybody's doing it really badly. You just you just have to show up, tell a story. Right, one of our one of our clients for a long time was a, a group called Excelsior Matt, who are a multi academy trust in Birmingham. Where when they came to work with us, they had four primary schools in deprived inner city Birmingham. Uh, now they have seven primary schools and they've met all of their all of the goals they set themselves when they started out with us. And they can't pay the teachers any more money. Yeah. And they've got about 6% annual staff turnover. So they've got to take the field with the team they've got. And so they decided to create a leadership framework and to talk about the mission that they were on as a business. And so when they started with us, they said, I said, what would you like to be world famous for? And they said, we would like to be world famous for innovation in education. And I said, how does it make you feel? He goes, it's terrifying. We're four primary schools in Birmingham. How could we have the audacity to be world famous? Yeah. And here we are three years later, they've got a weekly newsletter that goes out globally, mm-hmm. uh, all around innovation in education. COVID really helped because that gave them a focus for their energy to tr- when bringing back kids to school and how to do that well. Um, they used to get 30 not very inspiring CVs for teachers' jobs that they advertised. Now they get 300. They put up a job ad for a receptionist the other day and got 95 applications. Right? And, they, and So what do they do in their job ad is they say, they tell the story. They tell, they tell the story of the mission that they're on and they say, we're looking for people to come and join us. And yeah. so just getting clarity about that this is what we're about. We're about transforming the lives of the children in our care. We want to be world famous for innovation in education. Uh, these are some of the things we've done. And um, they used a tool that we introduced. I mean, we just, it's funny, we just introduced some business tools and they're like, God, this is amazing. It's like, okay. It's like, here's a wheel, here's a hammer. Uh, but, uh, you know, just outside of con- outside of the context of business in education, they've just had a huge impact. They they use a tool called Friday Pulse to measure their staff happiness every week. And so you go, okay, well, is that, you know, some people say to me, oh, weekly, I think that's too often. And I just think it doesn't, and when somebody, the person who says that to me, I just think it doesn't matter how often you measure it. You don't care. Well, because <laughs> the first thing I say is like, this is an amazing tool to to change the culture in your business. And the first thing you go is, oh, asking a question weekly, that's probably too much. What they mean is, for me, I can't see the value for me in yeah. being asked that question. Because I've got like, to put some effort in. It's like, yeah, well, so that you are the wrong person to be in charge of culture yeah. in your organization. Yeah. Because yeah. you're just trying to think of reasons not to do anything. Well, that that that's that's a similar analogy to the telephone book, isn't it? Well, would you just leave your team in the corner gathering dust because you haven't asked them a question this week? Just incredible. Yeah, uh, I are you finding then? I'm not, I mean, aside from these are the people that you um, want to work with, but are you finding that more businesses are are sort of selling their story about their purpose or have got a purpose, or is it still transactional? This is what we do. I, I, I think most of the clients that well, the clients that I work with have some sense of purpose, and it could be that they just want to build an amazing business that's a great place to work and, you know, works for shareholders, not just the investors. It works for stakeholders, sorry, not just the investors. And that's okay. Some of them want to try and build an, some of them are individual entrepreneurs who want to build a business and sell it because they, you know, that's their life's work and they want to maximize the value, but they don't want to, they don't want to 
They don't want to do it at the expense of their customers or their employees. Some people really have a a desire to change the world in some way. And I, yeah. that's okay. All of that's okay. I, I think it's, are you sincere and are you prepared to put the work in? Because yeah. honestly, being mediocre is way easier. Well, yeah, it is because that doesn't challenge you, does it? You know, you don't, you never step out of this comfort zone of, you know, mediocrity, but that will, and I suppose some people then, I'm just sort of thinking of the negative space as well as that positive, because I'm totally connected with the purpose. This is what we want to achieve. And this is, you know, we want to achieve it in this way almost and then let everything else fall in place to achieve that. Because if people are connected with that purpose, they'll always gravitate towards you if that if they're connected with that purpose. But I'm also thinking of that, that in-between space where people say, we haven't got a purpose, we just want to, you know, get a certain level of income, go through the motions, then we retire. What I just... Well, I, you see, I... Easier... But I think less successful and less fulfilling. You know, I, I look at, you know, the purpose for, for our business here is to demystify business growth for entrepreneurs. And yeah. so that's why we've got the podcast, The Melting Pot. That's why I've written yeah. some books. That's why I do a weekly blog. That's why we do weekly insights, uh, all of which costs me money and time. And I get joy from it, but it fulfills my purpose. And so with, if you if I didn't have that as a purpose... I would have to rationalize spending my time and effort on this in a different way. And I don't know whether I'd be able to justify it or not, but I w it would be different. You know, I might be saying, oh, I've got to write a book so I can go and speak in public and then I'm going to get paid for being a, a, a speaker. And the whole thing starts to have an economic motive, which is OK. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. But I, I think if you if you're that sort of business owner and you're like, well, I don't really have a purpose. Well, how can you make strategic decisions? Yeah, quite. Right? How can you decide that this is the right thing to do or not, or these are the right customers to work with or not, or these are the right employees to have or not? I, all of those things are just instantaneous decisions if you've got the right structure and framework. Yeah. And if you haven't, you just sort of stuck in the weeds. Well, yeah, you just exist. And I think that's, I think that's a challenge that I... I you know, often keep saying, well, what's what's the last in memory? What what are we trying to create here? What you know, I, I so I've got a I've got a I've got a quote for you. I would, maybe it's not a quote, but I was just I was listening to something the other day and I just. It's like 20 years from now. Nobody will remember. Uh, nobody. You won't be you won't remember what you sold to which customers. But I tell you what you'll remember. You'll remember how your boss made you feel. Yeah. Right. And so, like, you think about the companies you've been in. And the people you've worked with, you might not even remember who you sat next to in 1985, even if you were alive in 1985. But, you know, that, you know, wherever you were, I think back and I was just like, oh, God, I can I can think about every boss I've ever had. And I can think, how did they make me feel? And as a, as a manager or a leader, that's your legacy that, that they're your people. Yes. Every day you make a decision to make their lives better or worse. And 85 percent, Gallup reckon 85 percent of employee satisfaction is down to their day-to-day -day manager or team leader yeah. so if no other reason that you want to have leave your legacy is the people who worked for, with me th worked for me thought i was a good boss and supported them and promoted them and developed them that would be that would be a good legacy to leave behind uh, absolutely and and you know the the frustrating thing is you see it going so wrong in in large organizations but to be <laughs> a good boss, a good person is not that difficult, really. It's it's caring for people. It's understanding them. I think you've got to want to do it. And in so yeah. many organizations, oh, yeah. what you do is the person you get promoted because you've been here the longest or uh, or you've got a level of technical proficiency. Yeah. But... And you want more money. You want more money. So they promote you into being the manager because the manager gets paid more than the doers. Yeah. And it's just like that's cat. That is as that's more catastrophic than annual appraisals. Well, being being a leader is a role and not everyone is. So I was going to use a rugby analogy or sporting analogy, but it's not always the same, right? But what you do see in sport is 
captains are picked as captains because they can lead people and they get mm -hmm. the best out of their team. Yeah. But the challenge around that is they, they probably are technical technically proficient as well at yes their, at their well crowd. they're on the field aren't they but yeah <laughs> so it but, doesn't always stack but, up but the best players don't become the best coaches uh, no because right that... and 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 i think you know when you look when you played rugby right you know there you are you, i think you know you turn up and train on a tuesday and a thursday in the rain and you play on a saturday but to be a coach i i I think a bit like being a manager or a team leader or something like that, or, you know, CEO, you, there's, there's an element of calling to it, right? Because you just think about the people who coached you yeah. through juniors and adolescence and, you know, manhood. You know, they stood on that, they stood on the rain on a, in a Tuesday and a Thursday and they took some joy from watching the development of the players on the field, which is yeah. not the same at all as playing the game. No. And, you know, and that, that is a great example because coaches <clears throat> managers leaders they're thinking about it all the time they're thinking about how do i enable the people in my team to be better tomorrow better than they were yesterday and they're thinking longer term as well yeah but the challenge as well it, it certainly in a sport environment it's no different in business is your purpose is how do i make a better person to you know, almost to take over to then another way to engage a people. The pressure comes in from stakeholders and in a sporting environment, in new sport, and it, it's parents because all they're bothered about is results. And you have to be really strong then to go, actually, uh, this person just did this, which is amazing because they weren't doing that yesterday. So, you know, again, I'm going back to your scenario of, wouldn't it be an amazing that somebody saw that dirty phone book and they decided off their own back just to pick it up and throw it away or dust it down? And you would have gone, do you know what? There is someone in this organisation that cares about excellence. There's someone who's done it even better. But nobody else other than you might have seen that. Well, you see, I go, when I was, my first job out of uni was working as a store manager on the graduate trainee programme at Marks and Spencer's. And it was in it got it was lauded by management today as Britain's best managed company, except in our store in Chesterfield, there was a poster on the wall in the warehouse that said doing a good job around here is like pissing yourself in a dark suit. It gives you a warm feeling, but nobody else notices. <laughs> right. And I just I just think those two things for me are this sort of, you know, there's the public image and then there's the reality. Yeah. And and it, it's and it was funny. In its own right, and it was funny that nobody took it down. <laughs> well, because it was, it was actually, true. I'm just, it is quite creative, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> That's probably why. Well, in in, in Liver in the Liverpool store, which I was at before before then, the uh, the head of the warehouse, we'd have a load of students come in and work for us over Christmas, and he got them all in a, in the room, and he's like, gives them all the briefing when they start. He's like, I don't want any of you bastards working too hard. We've got to work here all year round, so I don't want any of you showing us up, otherwise you'd be out the door. <laughs> Oh, God, how often whole... do you see that in these police dramas as well? You're catching too many criminals. Just tone it down a bit. Yeah, you're making everybody else look bad. <laughs> totally. And so that's the, there's strong, there is, there is a strong pressure to just sort of plod along. Man, isn't that terrible though, isn't it? There's, but as we say, in terms of, <clears throat> I mean, I'm a great advocate of breaking down into thirds as well. You know, we, we've got this, basically 66% that if we all accept we're just going to plod along, we've got 66% of people that are always going to then plod along. Yeah. But we really need to listen to these 33% of people else. Things are never going to change. Oh, I think it's less than that. I think there's I think there's 1% of leaders and 10% yeah. of followers of those leaders, and it's yeah. that. They're the people who do all the work and get everything done. Man, that's a crazy stat, though. I mean, it, it, you know, that's a that's a gut rich feeling. So I was chatting to the chief scientist at Gallup the other week, and uh, he said he said they've just published their data for 2023, and they found 57 companies in North America, 57. That's all, where their employee engagement scores are more than 70 percent. Right. So that's. 70% of their employees are actively engaged. So that not it's not 10%. It's not 33. It's like 70% yeah. um, of their employees are engaged. And 
it, but it's just sad that it's such a small number. Um, and then, and then, interestingly, going back to the thing about you know dogs and children, he said, "Look, there's there's one thing that we can see makes a difference." And he said, um, "Have a one to one every week, not an annual appraisal, uh, and give the give your employees some praise. Do ten minutes a week." And if you only did 10 minutes a week and the only thing you did was praise them and nothing else, that would have a massive impact on employee productivity, employee engagement, and employee job satisfaction and happiness. And he said, because in the word praise, he said, are a couple of things are buried in there. We have set clear expectations of the role and we've measured progress. And therefore we can see that they are better this week than they were last week. And so we can say, well done. Because you couldn't praise them if those other two things weren't in place. Yeah. And he said, look, about half of organization in the US, there is no measurement in place. So day, day by day, week by week, the employee has no sense of whether they're doing a good job or not no. because there's no expectations and there's no measurement of success. And that's why they turn up on a Monday morning going, we've got another week it's of it. It's just a job because they're yeah. just shoveling yeah. shit all week. And it's just uh, like, why would you do it? Why would you do it with any sense of excitement? I'm just thinking those those 57 businesses are all working to get, they all know the leaders in each of those 57 businesses and are all trying to compete in their own little, you know, their own little league there. And and then the other thing is those two things, they're not hard work really, are they? And that's what steps out a leader from a manager. If you said a one-to-one -one each week and giving people praise is hard work, you're just managing a process. You're, if you're you not, go, you're this not is the, straightforward. You're not the leader that they deserve. No, absolutely, absolutely. Listen, I, I'm, I'm just, I'm conscious of time. I'm also really curious at the minute. What, what's on your playlist? What are you listening to, or are you reading, or watching? Uh, I'll have to pull out, I have to pull out my phone. Hang on a sec. Um. You, you've got me back on the. Um, on the uh, Audible trail as well. <laughs> so, uh, Extreme Ownership by Jock, uh, Jocko Willink. Yeah, Navy SEAL. Uh, so that's quite good, in, in, enjoying that. Um, what, why specifically that? What's, what I, I just think it's, it, it's this thing about, um, I mean, his sense of extreme ownership is really that culture, right? So, you know, that I, I will be the guy that picks up the phone book. I'll be the guy that just, you know, uh, sorts out the whiteboard markers. You know, like if you, uh, and it's interesting because quite often in organizations, you've got them at the beginning. And then I think at about 35 people, companies stop putting their cups in the dishwasher and management meetings are all about, why is this, why is it, why people just not empty the dishwasher anymore? Like last year it worked, this year it's, and you've just, just let enough people in who don't have a sense of ownership in. Uh, so that's quite good. I'm enjoying that. Um, Net Positive, Paul Polman and Andrew Winston. I had Andrew Winston on the podcast. So that's a sense that uh, you can't just, it's just not enough to not destroy the planet. You've got to run your business on an, in a net positive way. You've got to make, you've got to be making a positive contribution back yeah. to the planet. Uh, so that's quite good. And uh, I, I like that idea because actually that is then just moving the dial a little bit, isn't it, to say, because at the minute people are talking about you know net net neutral or whatever it is and you know this is about changing that a little substantially more yeah it well it, it's a it's a higher higher level of aspiration and then a book i'm nearly at the end of is called the 12 week year oh uh, yes by, someone else by brian that. brian moran and uh, michael lennington and so because I work with clients, try to get things into a quarter, you know, this is a whole sense of a whole series of sort of tips and tricks about how to compress time and get things done more quickly. Um, so I've enjoyed, I've enjoyed listening to that. Yeah. Georgie on our podcast also recommended that and said exactly the same about compressing the time and think it gets you really thinking about it. Well, because and I tell you what, the, uh, there's another book that I've just, that I just gifted the other day called 10 X is easier than two X. Yeah. And uh, I had Dan Sullivan. Yes. And I had um oh God in, in the ten X equal is it, uh two X preamble, I think, or in the audio, 
they talk about a guy who who had uh, he, he was on stage with Joe Polish. I can't remember his name, but I have had him on the podcast. God, it's terrible. Um, and it, the question was asked, uh, "How would you two X your business?" And he said, "Wrong question. It, there's too many answers to two X in your business." Now, if you ask me if I could ten X my business, I would have a much smaller number of answers. And so I've used that with clients. I had a client recently who was in, and they had a plan to. 2x their business and it meant they didn't have to fix sales so i said well look you know if you go back how many years from when you were 10 the size you are now and it was like seven years ago and i said okay well now what you need to do is think seven years from now what would we be oh we'd be 25 million okay well to get the 25 million what needs to be true and they absolutely couldn't avoid fixing sales as a function in their business right. and so they went away and they went thank you that was transformative because just 10xing has forced us to to confront the thing that we were trying hard not to yeah. confront. Uh, do, do, how do uh, how do people get hold of you, uh, Dom, if they want to? The easiest thing to do is to go to monkhouseandcompany.com, or one word, or find me, Dominic Monkhouse. I'm lucky enough when you type that into Google, I'm the only person who comes up. <laughs> top guy uh, what a top well, i could see why you hit it off i mean you you just it felt natural and you and you hadn't met him before the course you did uh no no i met him in london we had a chat um i had a i had a catch up um with dom um after that briefly and then i set up this um i set up this call actually and we just got we just got chatting listen he's, he's a super busy guy and i only really had you know sort of an hour with him it was down to the minute that he had to jump off actually but i mean some real poignant things that come out of that conversation for me and some of the language that he was using as well so i i think this the couple of things that stood out for me is that he only really works with purpose-led driven purpose-driven organizations and um whether that be startup or or, or or um established businesses um and like there must be so much that goes on there but what i really liked about dom he was like quite pragmatic about stuff no nonsense but yeah. it, it felt quite easy to uh, sound easy it might be cringing here if you listen to this back but you know when you watch a sports footballer or a, you know someone who excels at sport and they just make it look easy and i just yep. got the sense actually there's a safe pair of vans there in in dom if he's sort of doing some business consultancy for you but, but you see you say that and i i 100 percent get that because what i picked up in listening to the interview was that and we've, 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 we've had this conversation before as well he didn't say anything that was particularly rocket science he said stuff that was blindingly obvious but but people just overlook there's one in one bit in particular that that really resonated with me i didn't know where it was going and i, and I, and I absolutely love it I, I made a note of it and he's it was the example he used you know with the board markers he said when i go into some of these businesses he said and i go to draw on on the flip chart and i pick up a pen and it's not yeah. working yeah and i go oh i'll pick up another one the amount of businesses i've been into that, that's why it really resonated with me where i picked up and gone. to the point my way of sorting that now is i take my, my own pens in which is nuts. But I think the point he was making was someone in that business has picked that up, realized it hasn't worked and then just put it back. Yeah. They, they haven't thrown it away. They haven't ordered any more. And it, it's like, I, I guess to a certain extent that, you know, I said about my gratitude at the start, I said, it, it's that attention to do it's, I think it, it's fair to say when my daughter's going through these bits and she's changing bits on e-learning and thing, I would like to think it's because she cares. Or she's got pride in it, mm -hmm. and I think that's that's what he was trying to allude to there, wasn't it? It's like people don't they just they just don't care, and that's that, that that's the whole culture thing, isn't it? It's like you can tell people that when it runs out, do this, but why should you have to put a policy in place for that? I thought it was a really simple analogy, but totally get that. Well, the example that I really love was the example of a popsicle phone. So the, <laughs> the, that's that that's stuck in my that's stuck in my head, and the question: What do you want to be famous for? I was like, it's such a simple question in, in many ways, but so deep. And I kind of, the example of the, of the phone in the hotel where you can ring up and get a, get an ice lolly. It just that, that's that, that, yeah. I, it, it's fun. Uh, but it, it made the point really clearly that in order to be, in order to be focused, you need to be 
well, clear what you want to be famous for and then drive for that. I found that really helpful for my... For, for it's, it's interesting myself. when you say what you want to be famous for, because I think, Caleb, it's something you picked up on, and I, I, maybe we, sh we we could open that up and discuss that. You said that you were talking to a CEO, and they said they question whether anything they're doing is going to make them either famous or rich. Was that right? And yeah. if it's not one or the other, why are we doing it? Yeah. Yeah, and it, it's such a such a simple sort of uh, a guideline, really. And and I think, you know, I, I said to, to Dom about that, because that was a, a conversation with um, Sophie, actually, and mate, really, who's also joined us in the future. But, you know, it, it obviously works in their organisation because Sophie also said it gives us direction. It gives us a, a measurement to go, are we doing the right thing? And everyone, you know, knows the direction they're moving in. And, you know, that's that's that doesn't work on its own. You've got to have a purpose and a reason as well. Yeah. But, you know, that's almost your, your gauge to go, right, we've been asked to do this. Should we do it? And, you know, it's such a simple measure, isn't it? Well, does it make us famous? Does it make us rich? If it's a combination of both, then fantastic, happy days. And if it's one or the other, you know, is it going to elevate one of those two things? If it does neither, then we discount it straight away. <laughs> The two things that I really wanted to um, challenge uh, Dom on or ask him about was, you know, what what does a, how do you create a great culture, and then at the minute, how do you attract um, the best people into that great culture and keep that going, and in both scenarios, he had a really simple response actually, and as I say, culture, culture was around. Um, excellence and not settling for mediocre and so everyone giving a shit basically about what goes on so you know his scenario about the dusty phone book or you know the other the the overlook stuff you know somebody the the board markers somebody has walked past them well they're not demonstrating a great culture because if a great culture is is excellence and everything spins off of excellence I suppose the other thing is that everyone's got to be comfortable with challenging as well. And so all the other stuff that we've spoken about, you know, a, a safe space and stuff like that, then that all goes into that because you've got to call that the behaviours out that don't support excellence. And then, and I, you know, assumedly, and when I reflect on it, I think, do I get caught up in the, in the media messaging to say, it's really difficult in the job market at the minute attracting great talent. And Dom actually said, it's really simple. You've got to sell a good story. You've got to tell a great story. If you've got a purpose as an organization and you believe in that, then tell that story. And, you know, he spoke about the academies in Birmingham that said, well, we're not paying anymore. We're not giving any better benefits, but we've got an aspiration to to." to lead the world in what great education looks like and instead of now trying to find great people great people are finding them and and he said it, it's not difficult it's having a purpose believe in that purpose everyone is single-minded that this is the right thing and that it's values driven and then selling that story and everyone else sells that story around that and you start attracting the right kind of people following on from what Caleb was saying, "I love the, I love the, 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 the simple, um, the simple example, um, Dom game of, 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 of performance management and weekly ones to ones, and yeah. how we link together the ability, are uh, how it is that we can be so positive if we get two really fundamental things right. We've got a clear set of expectations and we've measured progress, and if we do that for the people that we, we who work for and with us, then." When we see the progress, we've got something positive to say, yeah. but without the without the clear expectations and the manage the measurement of progress, positive things to say are, are, are that much more challenging to, to to find. They 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 lack meaning, and I just thought that was brilliant because yeah. feedback <laughs> often is a thing that we think of in terms of feeding back negatively. But if we've got the clear expectations and the, and the measure and we've measured progress, then then improvement is 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 almost guaranteed and therefore think positive things to say will will flow and that just seemed 
brilliant to me. I, I think he had a very interesting take on the whole um, appraisals piece anyway, didn't he? Yes. I mean, the, the whole... Yeah, and I've, I've always been a real advocate of that, which is, you know, people say, oh, I've got, got my appraisal coming up, I'm really worried about it. And I'm thinking, why, why should it ever be a surprise? No. And no. It, it shouldn't, right? It, it, no. it, it should be almost... And I think it's what, what Don was alluding to, isn't it? It, 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 it should be... A, a, a summary chat and nothing else. Yeah, what, if, if I haven't been performing for three quarters and now we're sitting down to do a performance, why would I be surprised? Assuming, and this is the big bit, isn't it? Assuming someone's had those conversations with me for the last three quarters to tell me that. And in a lot of cases, they haven't. So you know, I, I hate that idea of, oh, I'm going in to, to have this meeting now and, and I don't really know what's coming. Why would I not know what's coming out? Well, it's, that, it's crackers. That, that, that's really poor leadership then, isn't it? Yeah. I, I think. And uh, again, without sort of repeating everything that Dom uh, has said already, the things that left me in that conversation thinking and reflecting are like the stats that um, he referenced from Gallup. So there's a tiny a tiny amount of businesses across the UK that are doing outstandingly well with people. And Gallup have said the bare minimum is simply to have weekly one-to-ones with your team, uh, with your people in your team and give praise because that also suggests that um, your team know what they're doing and the expectations are set. Now, it, to do that, if you cannot do that, then you should not be a leader. And, you know, that. so that's fundamental. If, if your response to oh, weekly one-to-ones, don't be a leader, right? Because you're not helping that culture of excellence. And then the other thing that really sticks in my mind now and should be one of these little golden nuggets for anyone listening is how, what's your lasting legacy? How do you want the people around yeah. you to feel? And, and I actually took that one step and not just in a work leadership, but as a person, you know, a human being in the world. Mm. What is your lasting legacy? How do you want to be remembered? And, you know, if you took that away, you would be a much better person for it. And unless you are one of these that go, my lasting legacy is to really piss everyone off and to be horrible. <laughs> yeah. Now, you know, you do that, mate, but that that's probably not a group of circle that I want to be part of. You know, I want to be part of another group of friends. I, I, I love that. I, I was, um, we, we deliver a lot of first time uh, manager stuff. And, and I know it sounds like a really simple exercise, but one of the exercises I like to do with them is it's similar to what you just said there. I get them to get a post-it note and I said, right, I want you to write down a word that describes the leader. So if, if I was asking someone else to describe you as a manager, write down a word that, 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 that you, you would like them to use. And they write down things like flexible, fair, you know, whatever it may be. So they do all of that. And they go, yeah, yeah, that's what I'd like them to say. And I go, okay, now I'm going to give you three more post-it notes. I want you to write down three words that you think they actually use. And the amount of them say, oh, they think I'm a bit of dictator. They think I'm a bit of this. They think I'm a bit of this. Well, if you know this, <laughs> what, what, what are you doing? What, what are you going to do to move from that there to there then? Because that's what you aspire to. So how can I help you do that? And you're right, it's really interesting for them to hear them say, well, I want to be seen like that, but I'm just not. And it's like, almost like it's unfair. And you know, well, you can do something about it, right? Yeah. What do I need to be listening to? What have you been watching? What's in your playlist? Well, I, I've got a bit of a spin on this, right? Um, <laughs> Um, so you mean you haven't got one, and so you're making it all wrong. He's got more than one, as usual. I've got lots. My what's on my playlist is actually growing now. I've got listen, read, watch, playing, and Ow. learning. Right, and I'd love to spare. This would be a whole podcast, but I thought I'm going to pick one out. I'm absolutely obsessed with Red Dead Redemption Two on the PlayStation. I've never been a gamer. Uh, my son gave me the bug and said, oh, I love this game. Uh, no, he said, I'm thinking of buying a PS5. And I pipped him to the post and I said, right, now I've got one. What should I be playing? And he said, I'll oh, get Red Dead Redemption 2. I cannot put the damn thing down. I love it. It's got a real mix of um, like following a story, uh, uncovering hidden treasure and stuff. But um, the reason why that's on my playlist as well it is... 
I spoke to a colleague a little while ago and said, oh, I'm not a gamer at all. I just can't see the um, purpose to it. it I, I, I need to be productive. And she said to me, think about your body and your mind as a, as a car. You need input stimulus to drive output stimulus. And too much um, output, i.e., you know, you always want to be productive, is going to dry up at some point. So you need input stimulus. So I'm blaming her for giving me the okay to go. I'm I'm playing games now. It's cool. <laughs> Just out of interest, when do you do that? Um, when whenever I sort of get a moment, really, you know. And I I think the so it might be in the day, in the evening, or at night. So you know, no, no particular time. It's just when I feel a moment. And I have to say, the first the challenge is not the time or always it's um not feeling guilty yeah you know and because again i've associated in the past with playing games as a waste of time and therefore not being productive and so my immediate reaction it, when i've played it was like oh, i'm being really naughty here playing the game i should be doing something purposeful yeah. uh, but you know the more you come to terms and say well this is just time away from the the ordinary, you know, the day stuff, the work or whatever, and it's given me stimulus as well. So, you know, again, I went on Mid Journey the other day as a result of that and went, wouldn't it be cool if there was an Apple shop in Red Dead Redemption looked like a, you know, a stable and stuff like that. So it does, it works, absolutely works. And nobody should be guilty about just taking this time to go and do something completely different. If we haven't got a console... What should we be watching? That's not easy to say. Jonathan, what you got? You got anything well, watching? Well, I've, I've been uh, I've been watching Diplomat, the Diplomat on uh, Netflix, um, which I have been uh, I've been thoroughly enjoying actually. I'm uh, I'm four episodes in. It's a it's a bit sort of West Wing meets uh, based in based in the UK. So yeah, it's um so it's a bit it's a bit like a cross between West Wing and um. And spooks, I suppose, as those kind of production values kind of going on. It's uh, yeah, it's pretty, it's pretty cool. It is the first four episodes of a new series, so it's kind of, it's a bit of a grow. It's getting better as they as it as it goes <laughs> through, but it is, it is really good. And the other thing that I've obviously I've kind of become completely obsessed with my Brompton. So the other thing that I'm watching <laughs> is any Brompton related YouTube videos about minor modifications and improvements oh my goodness I'm turning into a right old geek there was a flying, <laughs> there was a documentary on i can't remember if it was channel four or bbc about the brompton factory there was yeah 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 it's, yeah i i will uh, i'll look that up well, I've, I've i have watched various videos of them being made and kind of gone oh that's clever engineering in the kind <laughs> of which is um yeah but hey and it's a british company and it's a Indeed. British company made in London. Hurrah! Yeah. What, what's on your Lovely. list then, Westy? All right, I'm, I'm going to go completely off. off, the, off I'm going to go for TV first. Um, as usual, I go to Apple TV. Uh, crowded Room with um, a guy called Tom Holland, who I think he plays Spider-Man, oh, I'm yeah, told. I did start watching but that. Crowded Room is really very, very, very good. Um, it, it, it's one of those where you come away going, I don't... What's going on? And my my wife's got that real irritating thing when we watch TV of going, well, it's this, this, and this, and he's, it's all going to be a dream, and he's going to, and she's always right. And this <laughs> one, by the end of it, she's going, I don't know what's going on. I don't think we should watch this because I don't know what's going on. I'm like, no, that's why we're watching it because you don't know what's going. On. It is very, very well done. So, and I quite like. It's a bit old school, I know, but they're still at the point where they're just dropping one every Friday. So oh, obviously. Yeah. Yeah. I think we, we picked it up three weeks in, which was great because we could watch like the first three episodes to see if it was rubbish or not, and it wasn't. And now we're at the point where we think, oh, on a Friday, that's what we do. So yeah, that's, that's I, the first one. I, um, I have to balance out, you know, the there's some things you can binge. Yeah, agreed. And some things that sort of drop every week. I think Apple have got into a cycle now that they're dropping it at regular intervals. Yeah. And, and then the other thing... Um, that has become a real but passion I think you of need mine. A mix, um, if you want to just go for it, um, well, they built Firefly into Photoshop, and I've been digging out old photos of maybe a landscape or whatever. I don't. I think I might have. You probably saw the one I shared. It was a castle in Scotland, literally lasso tall, around the front, and said, "Yeah, put put a lake in there." And the lake's there with the reflection of the castle. It's just 
amazing, mind-blowingly amazing. And I, we can get into this whole AI conversation if you want, but you know what? You still need to have the vision to tell it what to yeah, do. Yeah. Uh, that's the first thing. And it's so addictive. It's, it's, I, I'm loving it. It's brilliant. Right. I would, uh, on the back of that, I would urge you to look at um, Mid Journey. Um, so in 5.2, they've just released something called Zoom Out, and that will blow your mind. So I saw one the other day where it was a, a picture, full scale picture, real detail, and it just kept going and going and hey. going and going. It mad. Jonathan, over to you, I Whoa, think. We're thanks. running a little long, Whoa. aren't we? Massive, massive thanks to to Kayla for having a conversation with Dom. Just to summarise where that where that went, Dom was really was really uh, focused on purpose and clarity. Being, we have to be really clear about why we're doing something in order to be able to continue to do it the same or to challenge it and to do it differently. Um, he talked about rewriting the rules of the game, so asking why about everything that we do and finding a, a way that works. And he focused on, for as an example, appraisals, asking why we do it daily, why we do it weekly, etc. And he gave some fantastic examples of uh, of giving feedback. Um, weekly one-to-ones, we must have, uh, he was suggesting that we must set clear expectations. Um, we must measure progress. And if we do those things, then we're in a place where we can say well done more often and saying well done and having weekly contact with people is a is a is a game changer in having uh, cultures where people come to work they operate with care pride and excellence and uh, and work towards um, what it is that organization wants to do in order to be famous so thank you Caleb thank you Dom and we'll look forward to uh, seeing you or hearing being with you the next time we're together Bye for now.